So we proceed today with uh, a group of excellent mathematicians, but also a group of uh, directors of different uh, administrative units. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Brendan Hassett, who is going to tell us about uh, three folds of uh, over non closed fields. Brendan? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the invitation. Um, it would be nice to be physically in Miami, but I will take the virtual um, virtual visit. It's, it's kind of dreary up here in, in Providence. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is in collaboration with Yuri Chinkel. I had originally talked about uh, touching on topics of symbol invariance, but I've decided to let him handle the symbols and I'll focus on this part of our collaborative work. Uh, so I'm going to focus largely on the, the, uh, the, the more traditional results. Um, so on the, on the positive side, it will be pretty tightly connected with ideas from Hodge theory. So I think that's appropriate for this conference. So I'd like to start with a sample theorem to show you, um, show you where this is all going. And it's a, it's a very beautiful example. So here's the background. So I'm going to look at a field that is uh, of characteristic zero, but not necessarily algebraically closed. And one of the simplest such varieties over, over a field is a complete intersection of two quadrics. So X will be a complete intersection of Q0 and Q1, where Q0 and Q1 are quadratic forms. I'm going to assume that the complete intersection is smooth throughout. And there's associated pencil of quadrics that come from just looking at uh, the entire linear series that cuts out X. And so this gives you a vibration in, in quadrics of dimension N plus one over the projective line. An important invariant of such a pencil is the discriminant form or the determinant of the, uh, those quadratic forms. This is homogeneous of degree N plus three uh, determined well, the, the, well defined up to a scalar. And so the uh, positions of the points where this pencil is degenerate over an algebraically closed field will actually determine X up to isomorphism, but life is more complicated over, over non-closed fields. And so let me review a very classical construction um, for the rationality of such a complete intersection. So let's suppose that there is a line inside of X defined over the ground field. Um, in general, the variety of lines on X will have dimension 2n minus 4. And so we have such lines provided that n is at least 2 over the algebraic closure. There's no guarantee that such a line should exist over non-closed field. But should it exist, then you can take it and project from the line. And that gives you a map from X into projective space Pn, here n is a dimension of x, and this is in fact a birational map from x to Pn. So here's my sort of picture proof of the birationality. Um, so um, when you project from a line, so in some sense you project from a line, you take the planes that contain the line and see how they intersect. Uh, with the, the rest of the rest of the variety. And there's a distinguished point of intersection that gives you um, the sort of residual point and that gives you a birational map. So this means in particular that every X is, is rational over K provided admits a line over that field. And we always have rationality over algebraically closed fields. And so it's natural to ask about the converse. So if, if it is rational, must it contain a line? And the reason why no one discusses the converse is it's false in the first case that you could consider. Uh, so if you have a complete intersection of two quadrics in P4, a quartic Delpetzel surface, um, it is possible for such a surface to be rational without containing a line. Uh, the, there are different ways of realizing the rationality of a quartic Delpetzel surface, and some results in a single line defined over the ground field, but some results in a number of conjugated P4 
pairwise disjoint lines. And so you don't have to contain a line to be rational, even over the real numbers. Um, but when you pass to um, three folds, when you take a complete intersection of two quadrics in P5, this is rational over K if and only if it contains a line defined over the ground field. And so this is something that um, was found by Benoit and Wittenberg and Yuri and myself. Um, so this is an interesting result, even over the real numbers. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the real case, um, since this is a, a really beautiful example. Um, higher dimensional versions of this are open as far as I know. I, I don't know results along the line of these lines for fourfold that are higher dimensions. And so I think that those would be very interesting and worth studying. Are there any questions? Okay. If not, I'll continue. And so I'm going to say a few words about the, the real case of this theorem, because I very much like the geometry. And so, um, so I'm going to describe how to get some invariants to help us to analyze these complete intersections over the real numbers. So for the moment, we're going to assume that X is a complete intersection of two quadrics over the real numbers. And I'd like to take a uh, degree two covering of P1. And I'm going to think of it as a circle. So I'm going to write it as S1. In some sense, this is silly because, of course, S1 and RP1 are the same. But from the perspective here, I'd like to think of this S1 as being the, the natural circle in the, in, the, in the real plane. And so that natural circle, the unit circle, if you think about it from a projective geometry perspective, it maps two to one onto, onto the P1. And so I want to, to, to have that picture very clearly in mind. And so I can base change my pencil to this, um, to this circle. And the advantage of this base change is that the defining equation over the S1 is actually well-defined. Um, so if you think of it over the projective line P1, you can get confused about signs. Am I taking the positive definite representative or the negative def definite representative? From a projective perspective, these are equivalent to each other. But here I'm distinguishing between them. And it's just useful for bookkeeping purposes uh, to, to do that. So, so I'm going to pass to the space change. And I'm doing this to sort of des describe conveniently the isotopy classes of the relevant objects. Uh, Brendan, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, is there any relation between the uh, branch points of this double covering and uh, discriminant of the pencil? Um, no, this double covering is chosen. It doesn't have anything to do with the discriminant of the pencil. I think I probably would want to assume it's disjoint from the discriminant so that I don't introduce any singularities. Although I'm working primarily over R, so it's not, it's not such a, an issue here. But let's assume that the branch locus is disjoint from the singularities. And so basically what we'd like to do is we'd like to keep track of the signatures or the, the, uh, the number of positive eigenvalues of the fibers as we go through the pencil. And I want to encode this from a combinatorial perspective. So this is going to have some symmetry because when I pass from a point on the circle to the antipodal point, the, the, the number of positive eigenvalues becomes negative and the negative ones become positive. And so I want to develop some bookkeeping to keep track of this conveniently. Um, and so, so I'm going to define this positive index function, which is just keeping track of um, the, the number of positive eigenvalues. It has discontinuities when you arrive on points of the circle with singular fibers. Because the total space is smooth, these discontinuities, there's only changes by, by, by one. It doesn't jump or fall by more than one. And so we just keep track of whether it goes up or goes down as we move counterclockwise. And so 
I do the bookkeeping. If it goes up consecutively, I record the number of times it goes up. And so this gives you a, um, a series of numbers. And so each number basically shows the number of consecutive times where there's a, an increase in the number of positive eigenvalues. I don't really keep track of the negative ones, but the antipodal properties mean that for every positive place where it increases, there's a corresponding negative place where it decreases. And so, <clears throat> so I, I use this to get a combinatorial invariant that captures the isotopy classes of these complete intersections. And, um, and so the, the, this is a, a, an odd partition of, it's not really a partition because I care about the uh, orders, but it's an odd decomposition uh, of these integers k. Um, and so I identify two decompositions if they're related by cyclic permutations or reversing the order. And so we have this description of the possible isotopy classes for these complete intersections. So I learned this from a paper by Krasnov. Um, I suspect that this goes back a very long time, but I've, I found the Krasnov organization useful for our purposes. And so Krasnov gives, uh, gives this invariant of these complete intersections of two quadrics. And one gets nine isotopy classes for complete intersections of dimension three that correspond to these sequences of numbers. And so I just take the decomposition of zero, then of two, then of four, and then of six, and these are the possibilities that arise. So there is a distinguished isotopy class described via a trivial decomposition. And this is the case where all of the elements in the pencil are definite. And so in this case, the real points are empty. Obviously, these are not of interest for birational questions. And so then looking at the, the cases, um, one of the nice things that Krasnov does is he characterizes when a threefold has a non-empty variety of lines in terms of these isotopy invariants. And so he gives a complete list of all those cases. And so these correspond to the following patterns of, <clears throat> of signatures for the quadratic form. So this shows you how these uh, combinatorial invariants translate into how the signature varies in a one parameter family. I'm not writing down the points of discontinuity, just the points where uh, the regions where you have um, maximal rank. And so I want to draw your attention to three cases, the case four, 411, and 321. So these four cases admit real points, but fail to admit real lines. And so they are of interest for our theorem. So for these cases, we are going to look at the topological type. Um, and so in the first case, it's diffeomorphic to the sphere. In the second, it's diffeomorphic to um, a disjoint union of two spheres. And the third is dis diffeomorphic to a product of spheres. Note that the second case, the real points are disconnected. And so this is definitely an irrational example. Um, over the real numbers, connectivity is a birational invariant. So we knew already from classical perspective that the second of these cases was, um, was not rational. The first and the third cases, um, it's not so clear that they are irrational. Certainly, you cannot detect the rationality by simply looking at the diffeomorphism type of the, of the underlying real points because S3 can certainly support a, a structure of a rational variety. So the uh, first and, th and third cases, they are not rational by our theorem, but there's not a topological argument to conclude that they're not rational. And so I, I wanted to show this just to give you indication of what this theorem is actually saying in, in, in concrete cases vis-a-vis -vis the isotopy classification over R. So are there any questions about this example?
Okay, I will continue. So I'd like to describe the, uh, the ideas behind the proof of the theorem. Now I've sh they've shown you an example of what it says. Let me show you kind of the, the structure. And so there's really two sets of ideas that I'm going to talk about. One is the classical geometry of these complete intersections. And the other is some ideas that allow you to construct invariants that shed light on the, um, on the, the Chow groups of the corresponding varieties. And so let me just remind you what the, the, the sample theorem says. For a complete intersection of two quadrics, it's rational if and only if it contains a line. And so again, we have the pencil of quadrics and the variety of lines. So if I look at the pencil of quadrics, calligraphic Q, it's natural to consider the maximal isotropics quadrics. And so I think of this as being uh, a vibration over the base P1. Um, and so uh, a quadric of even rank has uh, two different kinds of maximal isotropic subspaces. And so when you keep track of those two different isotropic subspaces, you get the, the structure map from the uh, relative variety of planes to the base P1 of the pencil. Its Stein factorization is a, um, a double cover of P1 branched over the discriminant locus where the quadrics drop rank. And so C is a hyperelliptic curve. Um, it was probably unwise for me to call the map G. Um, here it's a hyperelliptic curve of genus two always in this case. So much of this holds true whenever you have an odd dimensional complete intersection of two quadrics. The uh, Albanese of the variety of lines is isomorphic to the Jacobian. Geometrically, the variety of lines is in fact isomorphic to a principally polarized abelian variety, but not necessarily over the ground field. Uh, it may or may not have points, um, but the Albanese is always isomorphic to the Jacobian of the curve. So as you look at these maximal isotropic subspaces um, in the fibers, each of them is of course isotropic to for its corresponding quadric fourfold, but it traces out a conic curve on the complete intersection of two such quadrics. And so I get an isomorphism between the conics in X and the points of this maximal isotropic subspace. So in particular, the conics of X are a atoll P3 bundle over the hyperelliptic curve of genus two. And so I'm going to just show you the basic structural diagram. And so I'm, I'm emphasizing this example because I, I want to, to use it as a sort of point of departure to show you what the basic geometry looks like in general. So let's see. So we have um, the, the uh, conics on X, they map naturally onto the curve C. Now, I want to look more generally on all degree two curves on X, uh, both the conics, but also reducible combinations of two lines. And so that maps onto the degree one component of the Picard group of C. And so the, um, the arrow at the right naturally extends to the arrow between the central objects. So the map from the conics into the child two is compatible with the embedding of C to pick one of C. On the other hand, um, the, the fact that child two contains pairs of lines means that we get a, a, a morphism from the symmetric square of the variety of lines into uh, this principal homogeneous space P, pick one of C. Um, so this is a principal homogeneous space over the Albanese. And this element P is identified with pick one. And because there's a natural mapping from sim2 f1 of x to P, we see that in the group of all homogeneous spaces over the Albanese, the class of P is equal to two times the class of the variety of lines. And so phi is a natural morphism induced by that multiplication map. And it's a 
a Coomer cortic surface vibration over the, uh, the, base, the base surface. So the fibers are just cortic surfaces with 16 nodes realized as a quotient of a principally polarized abelian surface by the sine involution. And so the left arrow, that vibration, is a cortic surface vibration and is compatible with the right arrow, var pi, which is a P3 bundle, atoll P3 bundle. And so this is basically um, the key diagram. And so in some sense, the point of this is to show that the, um, the natural homogeneous bases that you get by looking at pairs of lines are compatible with the natural homogeneous space that you get by looking at these conics. Um, and so this allows you to compare these homogeneous spaces in a more systematic way. And so a lot of what we'll want to do when we look at these problems is compare various homogeneous spaces for, the, um, for an abelian variety, especially a Jacobian. Um, and these principal homogeneous spaces arise naturally from looking at curves of various classes on the underlying threefold. So this picture, I have very little new to contribute to it. Um, I think probably Coomer knew everything here. Uh, Reed certainly describes it nicely in his thesis, and a version that is well, uh, well presented for arithmetic applications is in a paper by Xiao Hung Wang. So then, so suppose that X, our complete intersection of two quadrants, were rational, and that there's a uh, factorization of the birational map. Um, where the factorization blows up smooth points and smooth curves. And so if you look at the cohomology, the contributions to the middle cohomology of P3 come from the uh, first cohomologies of the curves that arise. And so in particular, it, is, um, it reflects the Jacobians of those curves. And so if you keep track of the bookkeeping in the Chow groups, so you have the curves that are blown up, that D, you have the curves that, that you can see in the cohomology, that's C. And so basically, in, or, in order for the, um, for the variety to be rational, you need that the principal homogeneous space associated with F1 of X, it has to be equivalent to the Picard group in some degree of a curve blown up in the sequence of modifications. And this is a problem because in, in most cases, this, um, this principal homogeneous space is half of pick one of a curve. It generally has order four. You, you can't have uh, a curve of genus two with a component of the Picard group that has order four in the Vey-Châtelet group. And so when you work through the algebra here, the only possibility is that the variety of lines has to be trivial. If, if you're going to have this kind of descent relation where F1 of X is, uh, is a, a divisor of pick one, this can happen if F1 of X is trivial, but it can't happen otherwise. So this is kind of the, the picture that we have uh, for the complete intersection of two quadrics. I'd like to sort of step back and tell you what's true in a more general context, sort of abstract this away from the specific case and look at a, a wider range of, of, of examples. So let me do that next. And so a motivating question that really goes back to Manin is that if you have a smooth projective threefold and assume it's rational geometrically over, the, over K bar, develop criteria for when it's rational over the ground field. And so there are, of course, there's some criteria that are, are evidence. You have to have a point. It's defined over real. The real, real points have to be connected. Uh, there, are there are criteria in terms of the Brouwer groups, um, that the natural morphism on the Brouwer groups uh, has to, from the Brouwer group of the base to the, the Brouwer group upstairs has to be an isomorphism. But the, the things that you can, sort of take off the shelf, they're not so useful when the Picard group is cyclic or has a trivial Galois action. There's just not that much information 
not that much mileage that you can get out of the, um, the, the standard invariants from Galois cohomology. And so I'd like to kind of focus attention on more subtle invariants that come from Hodge theory and the Clemens Griffiths philosophy um, is, is simply to focus here X is a threefold to focus on the, um, the intermediate Jacobian where I take the complex cohomology and mod out by the integral cohomology in the bottom parts of the Hodge filtration. And so in the case where there are no holomorphic three forms, this gives, in fact, a principally polarized abelian variety. And um, in particular, if it's rational, then the classical theorem of Clemens and Griffith shows that this principally polarized abelian variety is, in fact, isomorphic to the Jacobian of a, of a curve. And so the, as we mentioned, these curves show up in the birational map from P3 to X, they're blown up in that map. And so there is, um, in general, isomorphisms of Chow groups that are lurking in the background. And so if you have, in general, a smooth projective threefold and a smooth curve in it, and you blow up the curve, the, uh, the codimension two cycles and the blown up thing are the codimension two cycles of what you start off with plus the contribution from the Picard group of D reflected in the classes of the supported in rulings of the exceptional locus over D under blow up. And so this uh, isomorphism of child groups is in some sense um, um, a, a child theoretic avatar of the Clemens Griffiths argument. And so recently, people have extended these ideas to non-closed fields. And so again, we're gonna to continue to assume that X is a rational or rationally connected over the complex numbers. If its field of definition is contained in C, so if it's defined over some field K in C, uh, there are foundational results of Actor, Kesselina, Martin, and Vial that say that the intermediate Jacobian, which a priori is just a complex principally polarized abelian variety, is actually definable over K. And so we actually have an abelian variety uh, over the ground field. And furthermore, Benoit and Wittenberg have shown that if it's rational over K, then that abelian variety must be isomorphic to the Jacobian of a curve over K. So it's not just true on passage to the complex numbers, but that we can actually find a curve defined over K such that this intermediate Jacobian is isomorphic to the Jacobian of that curve and the isomorphism exists over the ground field. And so you can use these ideas of Clemens and Griffiths to explore rationality questions over non-closed fields in situations, for instance, where the intermediate Jacobian might become a Jacobian of a curve on passage to a field extension, but it isn't actually the Jacobian of a curve over the ground field. And Benoit and Wittenberg, they write a very beautiful paper carrying out this analysis that we rely on in our work. I want to point out though that for complete intersections of two quadrics, the uh, intermediate Jacobian is always a Jacobian of a genus two curve. And so the Clemens Griffiths philosophy per se is not enough to conclude anything about the rationality question. So we need some additional information beyond just the, um, the fact that the intermediate Jacobian has to be the Jacobian of a curve. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to go back to what Griffiths I think taught us about these intermediate Jacobians and why they're important. So these are really tools for understanding algebraic cycles. And so um, if we look at algebraic cycles, uh, one cycles on the curve, there's a natural map. Once we fix a base point, fix a reference curve of degree D from the Chow group 
I'm sorry, the child variety of curves of a fixed degree D into the intermediate Jacobian. And so this is well defined once we fix base points on each connected component of that child variety. Um, it's not canonical. We do, do need the base points in order for this to make sense. If you change the base points, the map it varies um, by a translation. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this beautiful construction that, um, you know, that guide most of cycle theoretic analysis, and I'd like to extend it to non-closed fields. And so suppose then that we have a, um, a sub-variety of the child group of, of curves of degree D on X, let's call it Z. And let's assume that this is geometrically connected over K. And so then what I'd like to do is I'd like to say, well, there's a, a map from Z, but it's, it doesn't go into the Jacobian. It goes into a principal homogeneous space over the Jacobian. Uh, the problem, of course, is that our geometrically connected subvariety, it might not have any points over K. And so I don't want to make arbitrary decisions about what the base point is if there are no points. And so the solution to this is that instead of mapping Z into the Jacobian per se, the intermediate Jacobian per se, we map it into a principal homogeneous space over the intermediate Jacobian. And this principal homogeneous space splits provided Z actually admits a rational point, which we could translate to the to, to zero, to the base. That base point can always be mapped to zero when it exists. And so this is a way of extracting some geometric information from families of curves on X that are empty. For instance, um, going back to the example of the complete intersection of two quadrics, there's no guarantee that a complete intersection of two quadrics in P5 will have a line or a conic. And so you might think you're kind of stuck with invariance but you can produce a map onto a principal homogeneous space for the, for the intermediate Jacobian. And so this is the general um, interpretation for what we did before. So maybe I'll go back a few slides. Yeah, so here are some examples of these kinds of maps. So I'm mapping the, um, the conics to, to, the, to our curve, um, which is a special case of the map from the full chow variety of degree two curves into pick one. And then the symmetric square goes into that same principal homogeneous space. And the variety of lines itself, F1 of X, goes into something that when squared gives you uh, pick one of C. And so in some sense, that example is a motivation for looking at these principal homogeneous spaces. So let's say that we have families of cycles over some bases. So I have Z1 and Z2 parameterizing families of cycles. I want to assume that they're geometrically connected. And let's say that we have cycle class maps um, from, from Z1 into P1 and Z2 into P2, where these are principal homogeneous bases. So then we can look at the product Z1 cross Z2. And so that obviously has a map into um, the child group of D1 plus D2 degree curves in X. And then there's a compatible map from that product into P3, a principal homogeneous space. And the, the maps are compatible in the sense that the principal homogeneous space that you get when you sum these things together is a sum of the principal homogeneous spaces associated with the ind individual pieces. And so this reflects the, the fact that the principal homogeneous space for the lines, uh, when you square it, you get the principal homogeneous space for the conics. So we really want to keep track of how the various parts of the child group, how they map into various principal homogeneous spaces. Okay, so let's construct a group. Um, so let's construct a free group generated by geometrically connected components of the child variety. So if, so it, I may be missing things that there, there may be um, situations where you have different components of the child varieties that are Galois conjugated. 
and I'm just ignoring those for the moment. Um, so I'm only looking at the, those geometrically connected components of the child variety. And so for each such geometrically connected component, I want to assign the corresponding, um, corresponding principal homogeneous space over the Jacobian. And so I'm going to encode this by this Galois cohomology. So I take the H1 with coefficients in the intermediate Jacobian for the, um, for the absolute Galois group. So this group, this free group, could be really huge and unwieldy. Um, so it's a little bit of a scary thing to work with. But when X is rationally connected, we can map this as um, into the to the cohomology as in fact it's a finite index subgroup of the invariant variant part of the cohomology and so this makes b2 look a bit less scary brendan um, uh, yes I, I, i'm sorry is b upper two and b lower two the same i apologize that is a typo please identify it should be upper two throughout my mistake. So in a rationally connected, so I think B upper two, I'm not sure how complicated it is in general for three folds, say with, um, with no holomorphic three forms, but things get easier when you're working with rationally connected varieties and especially they get easier with prime final three folds. For prime final three folds, we know a lot about the lines. Um, and so we can actually interpret these as being um, equivalent to the, to the homology of the, of the threefold. So you have lines, you have conics, you don't have to worry about other things that, um, that could cause confusion. And so this means that when you have such a prime final threefold over a non-closed field, you actually get a cyclic subgroup of the Bay Chatelet group associated to the intermediate Jacobian. So then, so let's suppose that we have that X is a, a rational threefold over K. We know from Benoit Wittenberg that the intermediate Jacobian is a Jacobian of a curve, um, may not be connected but we have that identification. And so then uh, we're gonna look at the principal homogeneous spaces um, for the intermediate Jacobian that arise from curves of various types on X. And so the basic assertion that I want to, to make is that the principal homogeneous spaces that arise from these uh, connected and geometrically connected components of the child variety, they're necessarily of the form pick E of D for some degree E associated with, with our curve. And so in the especially nice case where the curve is geometrically connected of, of genus G, we know that the, that the principal homogeneous spaces associated with the Picard groups are annihilated by 2G minus two because we have a canonical divisor. And so that you, we get that the principal homogeneous space in the case where X is rational, is annihilated by 2G minus two. That's not always the case for complete intersections of two quadrics. There are examples where the principal homogeneous space is, um, is an annihilated by four, but not annihilated by two. And so these observations, um, so we found them, Kuzetsov uh, found them, Wittenberg also observed these things, and so I want to, to mention all these names I, that contributed to the development of this perspective. And so this gives you, uh, maybe I shouldn't have said rationality criterion, I should have said irrationality criterion, because this allows you to uh, show that you, have, you could have a threefold whose um, intermediate Jacobian is the Jacobian of, the cur of a curve, but nonetheless fails to, um, to be rational over the ground field because the principal homogeneous spaces that you extract from the curves on that threefold don't satisfy the, the requisite uh, vanishing conditions. So anyway, this is the irrationality criterion that generalizes um, 
what we did for the two quadrics case. So I'm going to pause for a moment in case there are questions. So can I ask if you, when you speak about Chow varieties, do you mean like only rational curves or higher genus curves as well? Um, I, in general, I would allow higher genus curves as well. Um, so things for, for these prime final threefolds, you don't get any more data by passing to um, higher genus curves. In some sense, the higher genus curves, if you deform them in geometrically connected families, they're, they're going to kind of break up into pieces, at least after adding some rational curves to them. So from the standpoint of um, getting invariants, I mean, we're only sort of interested in these connected families. And so allowing higher genus curves, it doesn't get us any more information. And in general, though, I, if we have something that's not rationally connected, I don't, there could be a lot more information, I guess. OK, thank you. I think I heard someone else saying something, but maybe I missed it. OK, let me go on. I'd like to give one other example that we found after sort of working this out. This is also very nicely presented. A, a, a similar presentation is found in a paper by Kuznetsov and Prokhorov. Um, so um, uh, they actually have a very comprehensive analysis of what these um, uh, techniques mean for the Manin problem. But I'm going to just do one example here just to because that's what I think I can present with the time that we have remaining. And so let me talk about final three folds of degree 18. Um, so let me remind you a little bit about what final three folds of 18, degree 18 look like. So they are easily or at least elegantly expressed using the uh, projective geometry of the exceptional Lie group G2. Uh, we look at the adjoint representation of G2, which gives us a projective space of dimension 13. There is a unique closed orbit. Oh, for the moment, I'm working entirely over the complex numbers. Um, and so I hopefully did the computation right. I think it's a degree 18 in co-dimension A closed orbit, sort of a generalized Grassmannian associated with uh, the group G2. And then I can get final three folds by taking this generalized Grassmannian, Grassmannian and slicing it with, um, with co-dimension two linear subspaces. And so these are final three folds now embedded in P11. And the, um, the, the Jacobian, the intermediate Jacobian of this final three folds is um, again of dimension two. And there exists a genus two curve D with um, um, whose pick zero, whose Jacobian is, is isomorphic to the intermediate Jacobian of this curve. So this is another example where the intermediate Jacobian per se isn't going to tell us much about these, these are the rationality of these examples. And so what drives the analysis, at least for us, is to look at what happens when you um, look at projections from various natural loci in X. So what sort of alternate vibration structures come out in the wash? So these are, are lifted from the Iskowski Prokhorov book on final varieties. So in the first case, I describe a multiple projection from a line. And if I do that multiple projection from a line, the, uh, the map that's induced is from X to a quadric hypersurface in P4. Now, this is a good, this is good because it basically forces um, rationality. Um, so, so you have, if you have a quadric hypersurface and it contains a rational point, and it has to contain a rational point because we have this line defined over the ground field, then we get rationality for free. The difficulty with this construction is that the, um, the lines on our final threefold they're parameterized by a curve of 
depressingly large degree, a, a depressingly large genus. So you have to be extraordinarily lucky to, uh, to be able to produce such a line. Um, so it's, it's generally pretty, you have to, yeah, it generally isn't the case that you can produce a line because you, it involves finding a, a point on the curve of high genus. <clears throat> there is an, other things that you can do. You can uh, project from a point and that gives you uh, vibration in sextic del petto surfaces. I think this is a triple projection from a point over P1. Or you can project from a conic, uh, and that gives you a, a conic bundle structure with a quartic discriminant curve, quartic plane curve is discriminant. And so these are the kinds of things that you can do when you have various uh, auxiliary objects defined over the ground field on X. So I want to focus on this last case, the case where you have a point and you get a sexic del petzl vibration over P1. The reason why I want to focus it on this is that if you don't have a point, you're definitely stuck. You can't get anywhere. So the least, the most reasonable assumption is to assume that there's a point. Otherwise, there's no hope for proving rationality. Until then, the sexic del pencil surface, it's, um, it's known that sexic del pencil surfaces are rational if and only if they admit a zero cycle of degree one. Or if they have, um, yeah, so, so if you have a zero cycle of degree one, you're in good shape. Now, if you look at the triple projection from the previous page, um, you have an exceptional P2, the exceptional P2 has lines in it. And those lines give multi-sections of this vibration of degree three. So we know that the sexic del petzl surface has rational points over a cubic extension. Uh, Brendan, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure this is true for any point. Um, uh, so if a point uh, lies on three lines, then uh, the exceptional divisor does not dominate P1. Yeah, so uh, let's uh, so I, I suppressed the assumptions in the skofsky prokhorov um, so as to simplify the exposition. So for what I'm saying here, let's assume that there is a, um, a, a Zariski dense set of points. So in the proof in, in our paper, we actually do an analysis to show that we have a point where the projection is, is valid. So I'm simplifying things here a bit. So the condition then that, um, that I'd like to say is that if you have a funnel threefold over a field of characteristic zero, um, then the following conditions are equivalent. Uh, it's either rational over K or it emits a rational point in a conic curve defined over K. So the conic curve is useful because it gives us a degree two multi-section of the sexic de pencil vibration. And so that gives us a point of degree two. And if we have points of relatively prime degrees, then those uh, points allow us to deduce the existence of a, of a rational point. Um, and so, so one direction of this, well, Ignoring the, 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 the technical point that you need a, 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 a reasonably good rational point, that you need the points are, are dense, uh, it essentially follows from the, from the sketch I, I showed above. So the other direction, namely that the rationality implies the existence of a conic curve, so it uses the cycle invariance that I described above. Because as... Um, so as noted, I, I think in a, a paper by, by Sasha, uh, the conics on X is always a smooth variety and isomorphic to a principal homogeneous space over the Jacobian of our genus two curve D. And so, um, and so this, this is a, one of the relevant cycle invariants that we have to consider. Uh, so this is an, another example of how these invariants can shed light on birationality questions. 
So there are many further examples that Prokhorov and Kuznetsov have, have presented, and I will refer you to their paper. So we've basically um, done the, the characterization of rationality of Fano prime threefolds and much more else to boot. So there are some questions that I don't know the answer to, but maybe some people in the audience do know the answer. So suppose that you have a conic bundle uh, degenerating, degenerating over a quartic plane curve, smooth quartic plane curve. Can we characterize precisely when it's rational over the ground field? So there are certainly cases where it's not rational. And so the, the, the beautiful paper, uh, Benoit Wittenberg, where they do the characterization of intermediate Jacobians over non-closed fields as a rationality invariant. So there, there are key examples are conic bundles that degenerate over a smooth quartic plane curve. And when this constant alpha is not a square in a field K, they show that these are not rational. There are other examples that can be obtained by taking uh, a complete intersection of two quadrics that contains a conic curve and projecting from that conic curve. And that projection map will give you a conic bundle branched over a quartic plane curve. And these are not always rational. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to, to, to clarify for these conic bundles which ones are rational and which ones aren't. Um, so this, this is something that is not completely clear, at least to me, based on what I know of the relevant invariants. So I am a little unsure how much time I should take, Ludmill, but I think I'm going to take the position that 60 minutes means 50 minutes plus some time for questions. So let me open the floor in case people would like to, to ask anything. All right, any questions? So I actually would like to ask, is the answer of this question known over the complex numbers? Um, I think they are all rational over the complex numbers. Um, I think that that's known. Yes, I think they're all rational over the complex numbers. So the over the complex numbers, the um, birational class of these is um, determined by the um, by the plane curve delta and the um, and the double cover associated with the the generation of the conic bundle over that plane curve. I'm assuming the curve is 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 smooth, and over the smooth plane curve we have reducible conics, and so this gives you an atoll double cover. Um, I think we can show that. The um, let's see, I think that it's possible over an algebraically closed field to uh, show that these are going to be birational to complete intersections of two quadrics. I see. Just okay. by reversing the projection construction. Um, so I'm not sure this is so. Surely the the Eskovsky school probably wrote this down somewhere, but. I don't know a reference off the top of my head. I apologize, I, I don't know the reference, but I think that if you work through and use the sort of the Sarkisov philosophy of finding a representative and then pointing it over to another case like two quadrics where you know that you have rationality, it should go through. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Ludmil, uh, I think actually this is done uh, in a different way in a recent paper by Bini and Kapustka brothers. Mm -hmm. They have a paper about symmetric resolutions of uh, things like this, and I, I think they prove this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Uh, could I ask you a couple of questions about the relation with moduli of bundles? Um, when you when you talk about the intersection of two quadrics in P five, that makes one think obviously of a moduli space of vector bundles. So uh, maybe two questions come to mind. One is, do these techniques apply to the question of rationality over over the ground field of moduli spaces of vector bundles? Um, well, it applies in in the one case where you we can interpret the complete intersection of two quadrics. 
and P5 as a moduli space of, um, well, it, it, let's see. You have to be a little bit, yeah, so you can interpret it as, as in some cases as a moduli space of rank two odd determinant bundles over um, a curve of, of genus two. So there, I mean, there's that interpretation. I have tried hard to, to really get more mileage under the vector bundle interpretation. And um, I haven't been entirely successful. Uh, it's a little bit irritating because the, uh, the G2 example also has a moduli space interpretation. Uh, that was my other question, great. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I'm not sure I can say it quite correctly, but I think it's a moduli space of rank three bundles, but there's a, over the curve of genus two, but there's a special, there's some kind of like, there's a special condition, some, some, some vanishing condition or some self-duality condition that you, that you need to do to get the dimension down. But there is an interpretation of this in terms of, um, in terms of moduli spaces of vector bundles, at least over the complex numbers. Um, and if you look at this, there, there's um, some three torsion elements lurking in, in sort of the Brouwer group over the curve. And I think that those three torsion elements can naturally be presented, um, at least over the algebraic closure. I mean, you have sort of Brouwer, Severi surface bundles over the curve that, re that are representing certain um, cohomology classes. And those are encoded by um, projectivizations of rank three vector bundles over the algebraic closure. So I think that this is, I think that this is the right way to look at this example. Um, I haven't worked out all the details of the descent yet, but I think it's a very interesting problem. Um, so, but yes, there is an interpretation of this in terms of special rank three bundles over the curve. Uh, that's cool. But so, uh, trying to go back to the original, to the other question, which is the question wasn't really can you use vector bundles to get to, to get rationality results, but rather the other direction. Do you think your technique would apply more generally to the question, the general question of when a moduli space of vector bundles is going to be rational? Yeah, I think that. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that the, the, the moduli spaces of bundles that we're looking at here for these curves, I think that they're known to be rational already. Maybe there are some other cases. Over the field? No, not necessarily over the field. Yeah, over the field. Not necessarily over the field. I think that it's, um, yeah, that's over the field. It, it, it might, well, the, the tricky thing is I don't know how to, to do the next case even of a genus three curve, even a hyperliptic curve. I, I don't know how to use these techniques to, to shed light on, the, on the, the next rationality question. So it, okay. it works in the one case where it sort of tautologically works, but. Well, I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll let somebody else ask. Uh, by the way, uh, Carlos, uh, uh, I just want to mention that if you consider the Hilbert scheme of twisted cubic curves, and this uh, uh, final degree 18, it is a P2 bundle over this genus 2 curve. I mean, the cur uh, the curve is this is explained in uh, our. Uh, sorry? sorry? Yeah, go ahead. This is explained where? Uh, this is explained in our paper with uh, Prokhorov. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Other questions? So, uh, Brenton, can I ask, so for those three folds you were speaking about, do you know what is the Brouwer group of them when they are not rational? Can the Brouwer group be another abstraction or not? Um, so the, let's see. So the geomet geometrically, the Brouwer group of these three folds is always trivial. Um, so if you look at, so I focus on cases where there aren't interesting Brouwer groups, that is cases where the um, Picard group is cyclic. So there's no Galois cohomology that you can um, work with. So the instances, these prime final threefolds, they, they don't admit um, Brouwer, Brouwer classes that you can work with. I mean, you have the classes that come from the ground field, but they, those are not very helpful. 
what you can do is you can look at some of the cohomological invariants and express them in terms of the Brouwer group of the curve over the non-closed field. And so the construction that, that, um, that Sasha mentioned, I think it was Sasha, that where you look at the twisted cubics and you get, I think you get a, a three torsion Brouwer class over, I guess it's the, um, is it the curve or over the abelian surface. Anyways, you can get Brouwer classes that sit over auxiliary varieties. Over the curve. Over the curve, yeah. So the, so there are Brouwer classes that encode some of these, um, some of these, well, they're related to the principal homogeneous spaces that are constructed. Other questions? If not, let's thank Brandon for the wonderful talk. And the last talk starts at five.